What's Islam? That's a question many people are asking today. And nearly Islam is the topic of many discussions. Yet very often, people don't really have the essence of the meaning. Even Muslims themselves are not really sure how to translate it. The word Islam is the only word not translated from the Quran when they bring it to the English language. And there's a reason for that. When we go to the Arabic dictionary, we find that it takes a series of words to represent the concept of what aslama means. Aslama is the verb for the noun Islam. It carries a meaning of surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace. We understand about surrender, to give in, submit, and that's to go along with something, to obey the commandments, and then to be sincere. Now we could stop right there for a moment and think about it. If it requires sincerity, then there's no possible way that it could be forced on any way. Because if anyone was forced to do anything, then it would no longer be sincerity. Thus, we realize the concept of Islam being spread by a sword or any type of force is impossible because Islam requires sincerity. Finally, the word peace. This is a peace that the person has in their heart after they have done the other four, meaning that they have surrendered, submitted, in obedience, and sincerity and now they're going to be in peace with whatever transpires or comes out of it. There's another word related to it, Muslim. For you and I, we might not think the word Muslim would be read to Islam, but that's because in Arabic you use a prefix mu before a verb to denote the one performing the action, whereas in English we use er, the letters er, as a suffix at the end of the word to represent the one who does the action. Like walk, er, talk, er, think, er. And then in Arabic, you put mu ahead of it. Adhan, mu'adhan, one who calls the prayer. Salli, musalli, the one who prays. Suffer, musafar, the one who travels. This helps us to understand that word, Islam. But what does Islam imply? We talked about the meaning, the etymology of the word, but what does it really imply and what is it about? What does Islam have to do with Allah? Is Allah God? Is there a purpose behind all of this? Who is this God? Who's the Allah? And in fact, in Islam, the most important subject is Allah. Allah does not exactly translate into the word God. And that's because the word God in English only has one form, God. Whereas in Arabic, the word Allah comes from Elah. And Elah is anything worshipped. Anything can be a God, a rock, a stick, a stone, a bone, things made with the hand, things that you could put out on a shelf or carry along with you and worship could be the stars, the moon, the universe, whatever a person worships, that's their ilah. Even their position in life, who they are, their degrees, their job, their wealth, their position as a human being. All of these things are ilaha, gods. But in English, you don't have a proper noun for the one and only God. So what they do is take the word God and make a big G out of it and say this is the proper noun. Whereas in Arabic, you can take Ilah and then you have Allah and it doesn't just mean the God because that would be Al-Ilah. But Allah is the actual name of the one and only God. And you don't have to worry about capital letters in Arabic because there aren't any. You can hear it clearly. Allah, the one and only to be worshipped. Now, is this the God of the Arabs as Muslims? Yes. What about Arab Christians? Did you know there are Arab Christians, Arab Jews? They use the exact same word. In fact, in the Arabic Bible, 
which by the way is much older than the English Bible, you find the word Allah on page one of Genesis 17 times. That's right. And in the New Testament, you will find it very easily in almost any hotel or motel you go to because when you pull open the little drawer by the bed, you'll notice that there's a book in there, the Bible. You turn a few pages, you'll see examples of the translations of the Bible into different languages. And the second language is Arabic. And the phrase is taken from John 3.16, For God so loved the world. And the word for God there is used is Allah. Now, what about the belief in Muhammad? Is that something that is similar to Christianity or Judaism? Well, for Christians who believe in Abraham, as Jews believe in Abraham, as being the first or the progenitor of this monotheistic belief, the belief in one God, then the answer would be yes, because this is what Muhammad taught. In fact, many people don't know this, but Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is a direct descendant from Abraham. Yes, by the way of his son Ishmael. So Ishmael is well known to be the father of many of the Arabs today, and it is from him, through Abraham, Ishmael, that we find others who come all the way down to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What about the other prophets that came by way of Isaac from the other branch of Abraham? Well, we know Moses, don't we? And David and Solomon, and of course Jesus. And we say, peace be upon them all. This is very important for Muslims to always say that, peace be upon them. What was it that Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, and Jesus had in common with Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. Do you know what it was? It was the message that they brought to their people. Abraham taught the people to worship God directly and not be involved in false worship or pagan worship. Moses, my gosh, that's very clear, isn't it? When we look to the Ten Commandments, we find immediately the very first commandment is that you shall not have any other worship except for the one God. Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me, is the way God ordered Moses to write it down, isn't it? And David, with his Psalms, and Solomon, of course they were on the exact same thinking. Their beliefs were not just similar, they were identical. And then Jesus, peace be upon him. Many people will tell you that Jesus says this or he said that, but when we look to the Bible, you know what we find? We find that it wasn't Jesus who had these different opinions and ideas. It was actually Paul. The quotes from Jesus in the gospel are so identical to the prophets before, you can't help but notice it. For instance, in Matthew 5, 17, when Jesus says, Think not that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. And not until all things are accomplished shall a single dot or jot or aorta or tittle be in any wise lessened. So we see right away that he was saying, I'm holding up the Torah, the law from before. Then when we look further into the book of Mark, we see what is the greatest of all commandments. That's in 1229, the book of Mark. And, and look what it says. When somebody was asking him, what's the greatest commandment? According to the English translation I have, it said that Jesus responded, it is to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, and you have to love him with all your heart and your mind and your strength. So, uh, obviously, we know now that this message was very important, worshiping God alone without partners. And that's exactly what Muhammad, peace be upon him, was trying to do with his people at his time in Mecca because they had strayed far away from their great ancestor Abraham. They still performed some of the rituals, but without the proper belief. They still made a certain ambulation around the very place that Abraham had built along with his son Ismail, or Ishmael in English. And do you know, and this is an amazing thing when you think about it, these people were actually thinking they were doing exactly the same as their ancestors, 
but their ancestors had strayed so far away that all they had was the physical representation without any of the proper beliefs. Not in their worship and certainly not the way they treated each other. These people had become alcoholics. They had become womanizers. They had become very bad in their business acumen. They, they were bad. We'll leave it at that. Because we want to come to something next in our subject about what's Islam. What about this book called the Quran? What is that all about? In the very beginning of the Quran itself, it demands that the believers who believe in the Quran must also believe in the previous revelation to believe in what is sent to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and what was sent before. And then the Quran goes on to tell us about the Torah, the Zabur, and the Injil. Torah is the law or the Old Testament. The Zabur, this is the Psalms. You know about the Psalms. And the Injil, this means the Gospel, the New Testament. So whoever would not believe that God was the originator of those, that God is the one who sent those down, if they wouldn't believe that, then their belief in the Quran by itself is not enough, because the Quran says that, to believe in what was sent down before. And what does Quran exactly mean in simple English? Well, it doesn't mean book. The word Bible literally means book, biblios from Greek, but the word Quran is Arabic and it means recitation, that which is being recited. And that is how the Quran comes to us today. Because did you know that the Prophet Muhammad, he used to recite it just as he heard it. He heard it from the angel Gabriel, the way that it was to be recited to him and that he was to pass it on. Now I'm gonna take a little break right here and we're gonna come right back and pick up where we left off talking about these books. Stay right there, we'll be right back. What's Islam? Again, we come back to the very same question. What does all of this have to do with Islam? Well, we talked about what the word meant, and then we talked about what the word Muslim meant. We talked about the word Allah. We found that Allah meant the name of the only God to worship. We talked about the prophets of Almighty God, and we even talked about their message, teaching people to worship only one God. We got into the subject of the books. We mentioned Torah, Zabur, Injil, and Quran. All of these came from the same God, Allah. And all of these carried the same message, that your worship is more than just your belief, you have to put it into practice. But why? Why is all of this together? What are we talking about here? Well, this is to help us solve a bigger problem, the purpose of life. A human being, regardless of who they are, or where they are, or what they do, will have this curiosity. They'll want to know, why am I here? How did I get here? And do I have a purpose? And if so, what is it? The only one who would really be able to answer that question would be the Creator Himself. If there is a Creator, it would be up to Him to tell us why we were created and what He expects from us and what this life is really about. Allah has shown the people from the time of Adam until right now, has shown the people what he wants from them. And it's a very simple thing. And that is that worship be for him alone without any partners. In fact, we know this life to be a test from Almighty God. That's why we're born and that's why we die. Because there has to be a beginning and an end for us to be tested on. The next life, after this life, no one will ever die again. A bad person or a good person, both are brought back and they continue to live in the next life, either in good shape or not so good shape, depending on how they did on the test. So we're going to be talking about a test based on worship. The worship of the God of Abraham. That was what was taught by these prophets. And that the person who's doing this is a servant, a worshiper, a slave. 
After all, consider the word Islam. What does it mean? Surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace? That's definitely a servant, one who really worships. Now, along the way, we find that there are going to be some tests based on what's called rights and limits. There are rights. God has the first right of all, the right to be worshipped alone without partners. The rights of the prophets to be obeyed by their followers. But then there are limits that none should transgress. Just as you have rights, I have rights, women have rights, children have rights. But nobody's rights would exceed the rights of others to the extent that it would infringe or oppress others. And a very important part of Islam is to know that no one can go beyond their limits. Their limits, they must stay within. Otherwise, there are no oppressor. And look at what Allah has said about that. He tells us that he forbids himself to ever oppress and he forbids us to oppress. So whoever is an oppressor is a bad guy. A very bad word in the Arabic language is one who does dhulm or oppression. Now let us think for a minute. We're talking about the one God, the creator. This is the same creator, the one that we know of from the Bible that in six days he created all the heavens and the earth. And this is recorded in the Old and the New Testament, very well known to Jews and Christians. Similar for the Muslims, except there's an exception. He says that he's the one who created the heavens and earth. He said to Ayum, which means in six days. But he didn't rest on the seventh day. In fact, there's no mention of a seventh day. It just said he rose above his throne. And there he positioned himself until this very day and will remain there. Now, what about Adam and Eve? Is there somebody named Adam in the Bible? Yes. Did you know it's the exact pronunciation of the very first person according to the Arabic language? His name is also Adam. His wife, Hawa, or Eve as we call her in the English language, and he were both in paradise. And they had one simple test. Their test was, enjoy whatever you want in the paradise. Enjoy it as you like. Drink what you like, eat what you like, except one. Don't eat from this tree. One particular tree. Don't eat from this tree. So now that became their test. Now, as we know from the Bible, the Old and New Testament, and of course in the Quran, the same, Adam and Eve were in the paradise. And they were told, don't eat from this tree. Then who came along? Maybe you call him the devil, or Lucifer, Shaitan, Satan, a demon, or in Arabic, a jinn. There is a difference here, though, for the Muslims, because this guy is not a fallen angel. No, because angels are made from light, and they always obey. In this case, he was from the people that were made before humans. They're made from something called a smokeless fire. You don't see them, but they see you, and they exist today. They're called jinn. Our word jinni, like the genie in the bottle, is coming from this Arabic word. You don't really see them, but they are there. Now, the angels always obey, but the jinn had the very first of all to do as they chose, because they have free choice. Jinn have free choice, but angels don't. Now, when God created Adam, God said, this is my best creation. I ordered the angels to bow down. The angels bowed down, but the jinn didn't because he didn't have to bow if he didn't want to. He could choose to disobey, and that's exactly what he did. He disobeyed God, and that's what put him in a bad way. Because of his pride and arrogance, he refused to bow down, and that became his problem. And he then wants to challenge all human beings and try to tempt them to go his way, to disobey God. If they succumb to that, if they go for that, then they'll wind up in hell with him because that's his last and final destination. So now we have a little bit of idea behind the temptation of the devil and what he's all about. So now he goes to Adam and he even tempts them to eat from the tree. They both ate. According to the Bible, according to the Quran, they both ate. But in the Quran, it's a little different because we know that they both repented.
And nobody is blaming one or the other. There's no guilt being thrown on the woman extra than the man. Adam did what he did. Eve did what she did. But the man does not blame her, nor does she have a curse on her or her descendancy. So the women are not guilty by the fact that Eve did anything, nor are the children born in guilt. That means babies are not born in an original sin. They're born innocent. Innocent as a newborn baby. <laughs> so, what's the purpose of life? Again, it's a test. What is the worldly life? According to Islam, the devil tempts us. Let's take a look at the oldest of the books in the Bible, according to some of the scholars, is the book of Job. We find Job is also in the Quran. In Arabic, his name is Ayub. Whether you're a Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim, if you speak Arabic, you will call Job Ayub. Now, he lost his wealth, he lost his health, he lost his family. He had very serious trials and tribulations. Now, I want you to think about it. What did he do? He was tempted. He was tempted very much. Just curse God and die. That's what the Bible says. Somebody told him, just curse God and die. You give up. But he was patient and he persevered. In fact, we use that expression today, the patience of Job. And so he had that patience. We find this in Islam as well. And it's a lesson to teach us. Here's a great prophet. And he was so patient. And what did he do? Persevered. And as a result, he came out a much better in this life and the next life. The same is for you and I if we'll be patient. Very good example. Let's take another example from the prophets. You have a book of Jonah in the Bible in the Old Testament. Jonah is also in the Quran. His name in Arabic is Yunus. Now what about blaming? Now, this is a good example about blaming other people. Of course we had the example about Adam and Eve. They could have blamed each other. They could have blamed the devil, but they didn't. They accepted they were wrong and they repented. But what about Jonah? He left his position in Nineveh in Iraq he went out to the sea in a boat, a storm came up, they threw him overboard, he went into a whale, and he went to the bottom of the sea. Now, according to the Bible, he stayed there for a period of time, three days and three nights, and then he came out. But it doesn't tell us the lesson. The real lesson comes when we read the Quran, we find that he would have stayed in that whale until the day of judgment had he not repented and blamed himself instead of anyone else. Because he'd been blaming the people where he lived because they wouldn't accept the message of worshiping one God. So that's why he left. But now he realized it was his own mistake. And look what he said in the Arabic language. La ilaha illa anti subhanak ini kuntu mini There is no God to worship except you, Allah. The glory and majesty is to you. And for sure I did the zulam, wrongdoing, oppression to myself. I went beyond the limits and I'm wrong and I repent of that. I'm sorry, in other words. So look at that, another good lesson. Let's come to some of the other prophets. In fact, I want to go to immediately to Jesus right now. Jesus, peace be upon him, as a, according to the Quran, he's the Messihi or Messiah. He is the chosen. He is the Christ or Christos. If you know the Greek, he was Christos, which became Christ. He's the Logos, the Word. He's the virgin birth, the immaculate conception. He cured sick, healed the lame, even gave sight to the blind, and even brought a dead man back to life. This is in the Quran, and it tells us he did all of this by the permission of Allah to show the people that he was, in fact, the very one that they'd been looking for. He was the Messiah. And he was the chosen. He was the Christ to them. Why didn't they accept him? And many of them rejected him. And only a few really followed him. But he was, according to the Quran, the very person they should have been watching for. Now, where is Jesus now? According to Islam, he's with God. God pulled him up and he's with God now. And he's coming back in the last day. How? Alive. He left the earth alive. He's with God, alive, and he will return alive. Similar to the way that Jonah went into the whale. Alive, stayed in the whale for a while, alive, and came out alive. That's one of the signs that we know by. 
Now let's come to the next prophet, Prophet Muhammad. We know that Jesus is coming back in the last day, but let's talk about the last messenger. After Jesus, peace be upon him, there was one other final messenger who came from the other branch of the Abrahamic faith. The last of the ones from Isaac is Jesus, and the last from Ishmael is Muhammad. And what did he teach us? He was, first of all, a normal man, normal birth, lived and died. He had excellent character, no bad habits. He was not a drinker, and he wasn't a stinker, and you know what I mean. And the time when those people all had these horrible habits, he did not have any of that. So much so, they called him things like the truthful one, the honest one, the one that kept a trust. He had many beautiful nicknames that they gave him because he was so oddball to them. He was so, what we say, square? <laughs> he was so odd to them because he didn't partake of their mischief and madness. So the worship of the God of Abraham is exactly what we were being told to do by Muhammad. The same message that came with the other prophets. Worship the God of Abraham, one God with no partners. And to believe in all of these messengers and believe in the books with which they were sent, and especially you have to believe that Jesus is the virgin birth, did the miracles of God, and carried that same message. The message of there is no God to worship except the God of Abraham. And Jesus will return to the earth and he will bring peace when he comes. He also warned us about Gog and Magog, Juju wa Majuj, and mentioned they would be in the very last days and watch out for that. Also that the Antichrist, in fact several imposters, would come claiming to be Jesus or the Christ back on earth. But don't buy it. Don't go for that. It's not real. The temptations of the devil will continue to the very end of life. That devil is not going to give up. He thinks he's got us and he'll keep trying. So we have to keep working and doing what? Believing in one God, doing righteous deeds, and repenting when we make mistakes. That's it. There's a couple other little things I could mention. And that is that since those days, 1400 years ago till now, we've been surprised to find how many scientific proofs there are. By taking what's being taught in the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad, many of the things that could not be explained at that time are clearly now signs and proofs that the Quran could only have been from the creator of the heavens and earth. The proofs about the universe itself and how it works and how the earth is turning and how it's round. Proofs about the human being, how they're conceived inside of the mother and how they develop in the different stages and trimesters. Things that were only known maybe in the last 50 to 60 years are mentioned in the Quran. And I would like to also mention there are six beliefs that Muslims have to have. Belief in God, his angels, his books, his prophets, the day of resurrection, and the destiny of Almighty God. And five actions. These actions must be there or it's not complete. To bear witness to your belief in the God and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. To perform the worship or salah five times a day. Fast the month of Ramadan. Pay the charity or purdue. And to perform the pilgrimage of Hajj. That sums up what's Islam. For more, visit our website what's islam.com